Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the secret pet cemetery of Hyde Park. Um, my name is Laura McMahon. I'm the community learning officer for the Royal Parks. Um, for those who don't know, the Royal Parks is a charity. We support the eight Royal Parks in London, which are Greenwich, Regents, St James's Park, Green Park, Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens, Richmond and Bushy. We also manage uh, other green spaces like Victoria Tower Gardens and Brompton Cemetery. Today, this is our first virtual tour. Normally, we would be delivering uh, live walking tours in our parks, but we've had to adapt because of COVID, which means that you get to explore these amazing spaces from the comfort of your own home. Today in London, it is raining, so I'm sure people appreciate not having to travel in. Um, this event is part of our Halloween Discovery Week and we have a whole host of other free virtual activities that you can check out, including another virtual event similar to this, which is called The Good Death Victorian Morning in Brompton Cemetery. So that is on tomorrow at half five. So if you would like to sign up to that, I'll put all the information in the Q&A section. This evening I am joined by Jonathan Grun. Jonathan is a City of Westminster guide and he's been delivering walking tours for us for around five years now. Jonathan's going to be telling us a bit about the inception of the Pet Cemetery and telling us some of the stories about the pets that are buried there. We're also going to be joined by Eric Turingney. Eric is a lecturer from the University of Newcastle. He has just released a research paper on pet cemeteries and will be teaching us a bit about the archaeology of pet cemeteries and what they tell us about our relationship with pets and how it's changed over the centuries. Bit of housekeeping before we start. The session will be uh, about an hour long, so we should finish up about half six um, GMT. There will be about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for q and If you haven't seen already, there is a Q&A function on my computer. It is on the top right hand corner. It might be slightly different for you, but it looks like two little speech bubbles. Um, in there, you can ask any questions. If you're having any technical issues, we'll try and get to you straight away. If you have a question for Eric or Jonathan, um, do first of all let me know who the question is for and I'll try and give as many questions to them at the end. The event is being recorded and it will be available to watch on demand on YouTube. We will be putting that up hopefully tomorrow but if not definitely by Friday. You will have noticed that um, you can't turn on your camera and your microphone. That is because we have currently 277 people uh, joining us right now. So um, that is why we're not able to have all of those functions on, but you are able to ask uh, questions in the Q&A. OK, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Jonathan. That's great. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Laura, and it's my very great pleasure to be your uh, virtual guide on this virtual tour, uh, but we are virtually visiting uh, a real place. So let's start by showing you a map uh, which um, uh, hopefully will uh, locate the pet cemetery for you. So X marks the spot. That's the location of the pet cemetery to the north of the park next to the Bayswater Road. Now, L Laura and I have been doing uh, these walks for several years now. They prove very, very popular, um, as you can imagine, because people really want to take the opportunity to visit the pet cemetery. And uh, some people certainly uh, make a, a day of it. They even turn up occasionally in a fancy dress uh, like the delightful gentleman on the screen there who a couple of years ago uh, arrived dressed as a Victorian uh, undertaker. Now, when Laura and I uh, uh, make our way through uh, the park with uh, our group, I sometimes tease her by asking her, have you got the key? And uh, Laura will uh, rummage um, uh, in her bag and then produce an absolutely uh, enormous key. And that is the key that you need to open a huge wrought iron gate, which uh, allows you into the pet cemetery. But in a way, why do we need a key at all? Well, 
The reason is that uh, as well as being one of the most delightful uh, and extraordinary cemeteries uh, in the UK and indeed uh, in the world, it is also one of the most secret. So we are now at the X on the map and you can see uh, the lodge there, but you could walk past this lodge every day for years and not know that the pet cemetery is actually hidden in the garden uh, behind it. In fact, the only way that you might catch a glimpse of the cemetery from outside is fleetingly from the top of a bus on the Bayswater Road. But even then, uh, you could only do that at certain times of the year. That's why when you do go through the wrought iron gate uh, into the cemetery itself, you have such a delightful surprise. You are greeted by dozens, hundreds uh, of tiny, and I do mean absolutely tiny uh, headstones, each of which is bearing the name of a much loved family pet. I know when I first went into the cemetery a few years ago, I just laughed with surprise and delight at seeing such an extraordinary place. And I think one of the things that struck me uh, was that it had to be the happiest cemetery that I had ever visited. I mean, of course, it's sad. Uh, there are pets buried there, but I think it's happy because it speaks to us of the special relationship that we have with uh, domestic pets. And it's just full of happy memories, happy memories of walking in the park in the sunshine, happy memories of throwing sticks, and also happy memories of some of those quiet m moments that you can share with uh, a pet that say much more than words ever can. Now, before we go any further, I ought to make a confession. Up until a couple of years ago, I would have been uh, not exactly the right person to lead these tours. And the simple reason for that, I have to confess, is that I just never liked uh, dogs. Um, to me, there were only two types of dog. There were small vicious dogs and there were large uh, vicious dogs and we know that dogs are very good judges of character so I didn't like them and in actual fact they didn't really like me either and um, when I was a boy um, I mean dogs it used to almost take the trouble to cross uh, the road to try and um, to try and bite me but all that changed a couple of years ago when my daughter and her husband were given a puppy. I say given because it was a pedigree uh, dog, but it had been born with um, an overbite. And so it had no value uh, to the breeder. Um, this poor animal was surplus to requirements. He was in danger of being a reject. And uh, so uh, they gave him uh, a home. And uh, because they worked, uh, we had to give him a home um, as well. And so let me introduce you to the animal that completely transformed my view of uh, pets. Here we are, Harry uh, the Westie. Um, on the right hand side, you can see Harry has just come into my daughter's kitchen. He's been digging ferociously uh, in the back garden. And when he does that, you have a few seconds to grab the tea towel that's designated for the purpose to, to uh, clean up his face and his paws before he makes it onto any of the furniture. Picture on the left uh, shows us that we were probably unsuccessful. He's having his afternoon snooze. You know, dogs are self-cleaning. Uh, and uh, so Harry uh, there is snoozing and depositing a fine uh, layer of uh, dust. Very intelligent dog in many ways. As you can see from the center picture, uh, he spent lockdown teaching himself to drive my daughter's car. 
he has got a wonderful personality, complex personality. Uh, he can be affectionate on the occasions when it suits him. He can be stubborn, that is um, probably almost all the time. Uh, he can be incredibly brave. I've seen him chase a fox uh, out of our garden, but on other occasions he can be pretty frightened uh, of things. We sometimes look at him and say he's got issues, uh, but there again in this year of all years we've all got issues, so really that just makes him seem like more of a family. So yes, I understand why people now love uh, their pets and when you visit Hyde Park the whole place just radiates uh, a love of uh, nature and a love of animals. Uh, as an example, if you get the opportunity next time you're there, visit the Animals in War uh, Memorial. It's in the middle of Park uh, Lane and it's dedicated to the millions of animals from the pigeon to the elephant, I think it says, who were pressed into service. And as it says on the memorial, they had no choice. Now, this memorial actually has a special significance for our family. Can you see the two heavily laden pack animals? I think they're, I think they're mules. Well, my wife's grandfather actually worked with ex animals exactly like that during the First World War. I can introduce you to him. Here he is. Um, his name was Reginald uh, Newbury. Um, if he looks young, it's because he was young. Uh, as soon as the war broke out, uh, he lied about his age and he joined uh, the army. He was only 15 years uh, of age. And uh, young Reginald served with the Royal Artillery and worked with uh, the mules exactly like those taking ammunition up to the uh, up to the guns. Very, very uh, hard work, very, very dangerous work. They had to make their way through glutinous mud and they had to do it in all weathers. And uh, when it was snowing, uh, the men and the animals used to huddle together for warmth and the men formed a real bond of affection uh, with uh, the animals. Now at the end of the war, young Reginald came back to Britain, fulfilled every boy's dream and became uh, a steam engine uh, driver. The animals of course had a more uncertain future, but some of them who were still in good condition were brought back to this country. And there's an example of that on the right hand uh, side. Um, the horse closest to us is called Jones the Horse, and he has an extraordinary uh, story uh, to tell. He went to the Western Front with the Royal Artillery in the first weeks of the First World War. And four years later, amazingly, he was still alive. He was in good condition. He came back to this country. They took him to uh, his barracks. And as soon as he arrived there, he had a look around, recognised where he was and trotted uh, to his horse box as if he'd never been away. And Jones the horse became a national hero. The picture there is taken of him uh, appearing at one of um, the parades uh, that he featured uh, in. And thousands of people wanted to see Jones the horse. And you could understand why, because having been through such a traumatic experience as the of the First World War, people took comfort in celebrating the survival and the dedication and the courage of this beautiful horse. So it's easy to understand why people wanted to celebrate the lives of their pets in the pet cemetery. So. How was the pet cemetery established? Well, let me introduce you to Cherry the Maltese Terrier. Maltese Terriers apparently have a lovely personality. They treat everyone they meet as a new friend. And Cherry used to love uh, romping in Hyde Park. And when she died in 1881, her owners thought it would be lovely if she could be buried in the park. So they went to the lodge and spoke to the lodge keeper who was called Mr. Winbridge, and he agreed that Cherry could be buried in 
the garden of the lodge. I dare say maybe a sovereign or two may have changed hands to uh, make it possible. Now, the following year, Cherry was joined by a royal dog, the appropriately named Prince, who was a Yorkshire Terrier owned by the wife of the Duke of Cambridge. Poor little Prince was run over by a carriage in the Bayswater Road and his lifeless body uh, was carried into uh, the lodge. And the Duke of Cambridge thought it would be a good idea for Prince to be buried alongside Cherry in the garden. And that set a trend for the next few decades, it literally rained cats and dogs uh, in the pet cemetery and hundreds, and Eric will tell us more about this, but hundreds of pets uh, were interred uh, there. I do think that for Mr. Winbridge and his successors, the cemetery probably offered um, a revenue opportunity. Can you see that? There is a similarity between almost all of the headstones there. And I do wonder whether if you wanted your pet uh, to be buried there, Mr. Wimbridge would have done a, a deal with a local monumental mason and perhaps for a few pounds or a few guineas, he would be off, able to offer you a complete package, uh, a plot, a burial and a suitably inscribed uh, headstone. So one thing we learned from that is that if you wanted to have your pet buried in the pet cemetery, you had to be able to afford it. Now, maybe it's time that we should introduce a slightly dissonant note, because when the Victorian and Edwardian middle classes were burying their pets in Hyde Park, of course, on the other side of the fence in the rest of London, people were not that affluent. In fact, Rather than burying their pets, they were themselves heading for paupers' graves. Here's a contemporary picture, uh, children barefoot in rags, um, disease, uh, short life expect expectancy. Remember, when the pet cemetery was being established, Jack the Ripper uh, was actually carrying out his reign of terror in the East End. Now. I only mention that just to put it in context, nothing detracts from the charming nature uh, and the sentimental stories that are told uh, in the pet cemetery. So let's have a look at some of the, the, uh, the headstones there that touch my heart. Uh, this is my favorite spot. Says it all really, doesn't it? We'll never know what sort of dog uh, Spot was. The only thing I think we know about him is that at some part on his body, he had a Spot. I like to think of him as being a rumbustious, fun-loving dog, uh, looking forward to romps in the park, always looking for an opportunity to roll in something uh, disgusting, greeting you with a ferociously wagging tail and uh, slobbering kisses and probably hanging around the front door in the hope that the, the butcher's boy might drop a string of sausages that he could make off with. In contrast to Spot, some of the dogs buried in the cemetery were expected to adopt the social status of their owner. Let me introduce you to dear old Topsy. For over 15 years, the faithful friend of J.C.H. Flood, barrister at law and his family. So Topsy is not just an, any old dog. This is a top legal dog. In fact, you know, I imagine if Spot was in the dock again for yet another offence of stealing sausages. It would be dear old Topsy who would be put in the case for the prosecution against him. But some of the graves, they don't rely on social status. They simply rely just purely on an expression of love. Have a look at this one. Darling Dolly, my sunbeam my consolation and just hidden be beneath the grass and moss, moss there it's my it says my joy 
even a century later, we know that the uh, Dolly and the owner are no longer with us, but that headstone speaks very clearly, doesn't it, about the absolutely unconditional love that they shared for each other. Some of the, the names on the headstones tell us about the boisterous uh, dogs who are buried there. We have Jack, we have Ruff, we have Chum, uh, we have uh, Nipper. There's Nipper's headstone. Of course, there are several Nippers actually in the cemetery. At the time the cemetery was established in the first few years, the most famous dog in the world was actually uh, called Nipper. He was uh, the terrier painted on uh, for the advertisement for his master's voice. Now, this isn't the grave of uh, Nipper. The real Nipper, actually, a bit like Richard III, he was discovered in Leicester under a car park, wasn't he? Well, I, uh, Nipper is actually buried under a car park in Richmond-upon-Thames, um, and there's a, a, a memorial plaque uh, to that. But the fact, I think, that there are several nippers in the cemetery might mean that they were named after uh, their uh, uh, famous uh, fellow dog. Let's look at more delicate animals who are buried uh, in the cemetery. We've got Pansy, we've got Titsy, Wobbles, Wee and Tummer. You imagine that these dogs, rather than romping in the park, probably looked at the world from the inside of their owner's handbags. Here's uh, the uh, gravestone of we. Um, uh, it says, uh, mon cher we, and uh, ma douce juju is also buried there. Somehow, I don't think we and juju would have been involved in much uh, sausage uh, stealing. Um, we talked about dogs mainly, but there are cats in there. And this is the most famous uh, cat in the cemetery. It's Ginger Blythe. Ginger Blythe sounds like a World War II fighter ace, doesn't he? But in actual fact, he was the king of the pussycats in Westbourne Terrace. He passed peacefully away, probably during an afternoon nap, I would have thought, in March 19. 46 and look at his age he was aged 24 years and seven months think about that think about that long life think of all the devastating world events that happened while he was living in westbourne terrace and the thing about that is that he would have been blissfully unaware of all of them. For him, life would have consisted of going out for the occasional prowl, finding a warm spot to have a nap, hoping that there might be a sardine for lunch and then looking forward to a saucer of milk before bedtime. And for his owners, who would have been painfully aware of those world events, having ginger around them probably was a great source of comfort. Certainly they've given him a lovely headstone and even a quotation from Shakespeare. Can you see his little life was rounded with a sleep, which has a, a quotation I think from The Tempest. And ginger for the last 75 years has been snoozing happily in a delightful quiet corner of Hyde Park. Now, some of the uh, gravestones pose questions that we'll never uh, be able to really answer. Some of them, like this one, read like the plot of an Agatha Christie novel. So let me introduce you to Balu, son of Fritz, poisoned by a cruel Swiss in Bern in 1899. Who was Balu? Who was the cruel Swiss who poisoned him? Why did he why did he do it? Actually, when you think about it, how was Balu's body even brought back from Switzerland to be buried in Hyde Park? We simply don't know the answers yet to those uh, questions. It may be a job for Hercule Poirot. 
So that brings us to the end of that. I just thought I'd introduce you to my favorite pets in the cemetery. Before I hand back to uh, Laura, can I just say I hope that soon we'll all be able to meet in the park again and that you will be able to visit this most delightful and charming of cemeteries to see it for yourself. Back to you, Laura. Oh, apologies, my my was more mute. So thank you, Jonathan. That was an absolutely beautiful um, story that you gave us there. Um, really, really fantastic as always. And yes, we're hoping we'll be able to start back our live walks soon. Um, I'm going to be passing you over now to Eric. Eric, possibly you'll be able to investigate in the future as to what happened to poor uh, Balu um, being murdered by a cruel Swiss. But I'm going to pass you over now to Eric and he's going to talk about the archaeology of pet cemeteries. Thank you. Hi there. Thanks, Laura. And thank you, everybody, for, for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm an archaeologist at Newcastle University. And I've titled um, my section of the talk today the archaeology of pet cemeteries. But don't worry, I'm not actually digging up any of these. Um, poor animals and, and looking at their bones. Um, I first became interested in pet cemeteries back in 2014 when I was working on an archaeological site in Canada in Toronto. And we were working on the site and we uncovered a, um, a dog burial. And that led me down a research path thinking, you know, I wonder what people did with their pets when their pets passed on in the 19th century. What was what was standard practice? Did most people bury their, their animals in their back gardens? Did they um, uh, bury them in pet cemeteries or what did they do? And that's when I found out that the first ever public pet cemetery was this cemetery in Hyde Park in Britain. So relatively recent in the, the grand scheme of history. Uh, we have this beautiful cemetery, um, well preserved, I found out. And, you know, as an archaeologist, I was well aware that human cemeteries have been a tremendous source of information over the for, for archaeologists and for historians who are looking to reconstruct the past. You know, um, we've looked at the text, the symbols and the, the the designs of gravestones from human cemeteries, and we've been able to answer all kinds of research questions about the past. You know, we've been able to reconstruct local demographics, uh, social relationships between people, kinship. We've been able to um, reconstruct people's attitudes towards death and religion. So I started thinking, well, why can't we do use pet cemeteries to look at changes in human animal relationships over time. Um, so that's um, how I got in touch with Royal Parks and um, other cemeteries across the UK. And I got to work really just um, visiting a bunch of cemeteries. I visited four big ones across the UK and um, recorded each and every single stone to see if I could track changing human animal relationships through time. So. Uh, I visited Hyde Park, the first, oops, the first uh, public uh, pet cemetery established in 1881. The last stone was um, in 1976. Uh, but I've also looked at four others covering uh, London, London area, but also Newcastle, um, close to where I live. That's the only reason I picked these two. Um, they were quite handy to visit. Uh, so the first one I visited was uh, the Hyde Park Pet Cemetery. Here's a lovely picture, photo of it taken in the um, early 1900s. Uh, you can see these stones are standing tall and proud, unlike um, what they look like today. They're all uh, toppling over, um, a bit overgrown. Uh, so they were they were quite well organized, as you can see. Now a lot of people have done. Um, I've written about the Hyde Park Pet Cemetery over the years. Um, and there's a number that keeps popping up saying that there were over 300 uh, headstones in the cemetery. 
After I did my survey, um, I counted a total of 475 stones in this small space, and I didn't get every stone. Some of them are buried um, in the soil over time. I haven't been able to find um, cherry and prints, so I think quite a few are missing. So over 475 gravestones are in this tiny little space, and a lot of uh, gravestones have multiple animals commemorated on them. So uh, near to or, or a little bit over 1,000 animals have been buried in this tiny little space, um, mostly uh, between the 1880s and 1910s. Uh, and here's another park I, I or another cemetery I uh, recorded. This is the PDSA cemetery in Ilford, which is right on the outskirts of London. Um, this is another important historic pet cemetery for the country. Uh, we have, again, over a thousand animals um, commemorated here. The cemetery went into was it was went into disrepair, if you will, uh, back in the I think it was 50s, 60s. Um, but has since been restored and is now open to the public to visit as well. This is also an important cemetery because it has quite a few um, service animals buried in it. So and in, in Britain, there is a special award called the Dickens Medal, which is given to um, animals who have uh, provided a service to the country. So a lot of animals who, who served in the world wars and in other wars or situations um, are buried here and have their graves here, and their graves are very well maintained. Uh, and then we have two cemeteries in Newcastle. This is the Northumberland Park Pet Cemetery, where there were 210 stones that I recorded here. This, like just like the Hyde Park Cemetery, is located uh, in a public park, in a hidden corner of the public park, but this one is accept, uh, accessible to people. Um, and lots of people, lots of local residents, um, take their dogs uh, on a walk through this part of the park um, every day and visit the gravestones as they as they walk by. And finally, this really tiny cemetery um, just in Newcastle called the Desmond Dean Pet Cemetery. Uh, this is only 20, there are 22 gravestones here and this cemetery hides in plain sight. So you are literally walking down a very prominent footpath in the center of a of a big uh, city park, and um, most people don't even see the headstones uh, very, uh, located right there. And this is representative of so many pet cemeteries across Britain. Just these are spaces that formed organically. A few people started burying their pets, and it went sort of uncontrolled. And um, now these spaces are sort of slightly hidden, and uh, people don't really know they're there. Um, before I talk about what I've been finding, I'd just like to take a step back to the Victorian era when the pet cemetery movement began and just talk about how this period in time in Britain was really a watershed moment in society's relationships with animals. Uh, this is a point in time where people started thinking differently about the welfare and the well-being of animals. It's when we see the um, uh, beginning of the RSPCA, the foundation of the Royal Society for the Protection of Animals. We also see the establishment of a number of institutions such as um, animal shelters uh, dedicated to, to protect animals as well. We see the um, introduction of a number of new laws dedicated to the protection of animals and their well-being. We also see the role of the pet, um, especially the dog, changing. Dogs are being increasingly welcomed into the family home and being seen as sort of a central figure in the family home, if you will. And, and scholars have written about, um, about this, this aspect. It's also in the Victorian period where you see the beginning of dog breeding or the, the introduction of dog breeding like we know it today. So the breeding of dogs to very specific standards is a Victorian is a Victorian thing. And here we have a, a photo of um, two Maltese terriers um, and their winning trophies. 
so probably what um, what cherry would have looked like really um, very similar to these these two. The Victorian era is also a period of conflict, conflicting ideas. So on the one side, you have the rise in animal welfare and concern for animal well-being, while at the same time, you have a massive rabies scare across the UK, um, which led to the destruction of many stray dogs. You also have the anti-vivisection protests um, arguing against the use of live animals in scientific research. So it's a, it's a time of conflicting ideas. Right. So what did I find? Um, well, first of all, many of those early stones, like a lot of the examples that Jonathan was showing us, are very simple stones. You got the name and date of death. So here we have Nip, who died uh, the 24th of April, 1990. 1894 rather, and Lil Kaiser who died um, in December of the same year. So a lot of the stones are simple. A few of them will have an epitaph and that epitaph will often reference uh, what um, scholars have, uh, have termed, you know, values that are truly appreciated in, Victor in Victorian society. So cherished or core Victorian values like fidelity, friendship, obedience, um, things like that. So here we have um, Jack, a faithful friend who passed away in 1894. Uh, another one dedicated to the loving memory of Sidi, the most faithful friend uh, who died August 11th, 1898. And then the, the final gravestone here doesn't even have uh, didn't write down the name of the pet, they just wrote um, my dearest friend and no year, uh, but we assume that this is um, late 19th century. Um, notice as well that uh, we see some initials on some of these gravestones. So here we have for CD's grave, DKS at the bottom and for this other grave, just an M. This is, these are the initials of the the owners of the animals. So this follows a, a standard practice typically seen in Victorian cemeteries, whereby that person who is commissioning or erecting the, the gravestone um, leaves their name. Um, I'm pointing this out now because I'll get back to this point later. Another interesting parallel that we see with human cemeteries from the time is the use of the um, sleep metaphor to represent death. So this is a common Victorian, uh, common metaphor used in Victorian cemeteries. Uh, in fact, it's, we still use it today. So we still use terms like rest in peace or here lies, uh, so and so. Uh, and we see this in the pet cemetery as well. We, here we have um, a gravestone for Trim and, a, and another, and we see the epitaph, we are only sleeping master. The, it's not just in the epitaphs or in the wording that we, we, we see the influence of the sleep metaphor, but it's in the basic design of the uh, gravestones as well. So just like a bed with a headboard a frame and a footboard, you see a headstone, a frame, which might have a, a, a ledger stone on top, and in some cases you see a footstone. So you, the, the, the symbolism of sleep is prevalent everywhere. And in fact, we saw it in, in Ginger Blythe's um, gravestone earlier with a Shakespeare quote. So what's interesting about the metaphor of sleep is that it implies an impermanence to death, that at the end of sleep will be an awakening. And, 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 and another, um, another aspect to life or return to, to life in some way. It's not just in the metaphor of sleep that we see this, but it's also in other sort of um, references to the afterlife. So 
here I have um, a gravestone to, this is one of my favorite gravestones. Uh, it's right upon entering the, the, the cemetery. You walk down a small path and immediately on your right, you see the gravestone for a wee little Bobbit here. So in memory of our darling little Bobbit, for six years, our loving and most devoted friend who passed away on January 16, 1901. Uh, it's a bit, it's a bit of emotion there. So lonely without our darling sweetheart. And then, what's most interesting is this, this other quote here: "When our lonely lives are over and our spirits from this earth shall roam, we hope he'll be there waiting to give us a welcome home." And then, of course, you see the uh, initials of the commemorator at the bottom below the grass here. This is a very telling quote, or a very tell telling epitaph, because. It suggests that the uh, owners are hopeful for a reunion. They're not quite certain about it, but they're hopeful. And many other epitaphs, well, actually, there are a few other epitaphs in Hyde Park which suggest an afterlife so clearly. Um, and of those that do, they're always hopeful or uncertain if that's the case. There's another gravestone that says, you know, could we think we'd meet again? It would lighten half my pain. So people are hopeful of this reunion. They're not quite certain of it. Fast forward to the uh, mid 20th century, about post World War II era, and these are, are images from um, the PDSA cemetery in Ilford, and you start to see Christian symbols everywhere. So in the whole of Hyde Park, I only saw two crosses on gravestones. Here we have um, in the PDSA cemetery and in other uh, post mid 20th century cemeteries, hundreds. Crosses everywhere and the commemorative text is much more assured of a reunion in the afterlife. There's a gravestone for, um, if I remember correctly, for Denny who died in 1952, which states, whose epitaph states, God bless until we meet again. So there's certainty there. That's not the only change we see um, as we progress into the 20th century. So you'll remember from all the, the stones, gravestones we saw earlier from Hyde Park that Jonathan showed us, all we saw were the pet names, mostly just the, the first names. There are, as we progress through to the 20th century and into the 60s and 70s, we start to see the appearance of family surnames. So Tiny Mills here, who died in 1954, and Lassie Robson, who died in 1977. The use of the family surname suggests that pets were starting to be considered members of the family. And you remember how I said a lot of those early gravestones have the commemorator's initials at the bottom? Well, those initials are no longer there. Instead, they're replaced by terms like mom and dad. So a very clear indication that these animals are not being considered pets anymore. The, the reference, the use of terms friends and companions doesn't appear as often and we start to see um, more familial terms like mom and dad. So uh, many of the um, pet cemeteries that I uh, recorded um, were filled by the 1990s. The last, the last few burials were in the 1990s. And uh, that is simply, in those cases, that is simply because that is when those particular cemeteries were full. Pet cemeteries still exist today and some people still use them. But since the 1980s as well, uh, pet cremation has become standard practice in the UK as the main way to, um, to treat the body after death. And with cremation, there are fewer who choose to then bury the cremains and put a, a headstone on top. Many choose to simply spread the ashes around somewhere, possibly a favorite park. Um, others choose to keep the ashes at home in a nice little urn like the one on the left here. And um, others still, uh, rather than uh, commemorate their animals through a gravestone, will choose to 
commemorate their animals in a commemorative garden. So here's an example from the PDSA Pet Cemetery again, where you can no longer bury your pets, but you can purchase a commemorative plaque with that bears the PDSA logo on it, have the name of the animal, of, of your animal, the date of, date of birth, date of death, and commemorate them in their garden. One of the things that struck me the most as a constant through time is the emotions evident in this space and in the individual gravestones. So you can tell that these relationships meant a lot to the people who, 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 who lost the relationship. So here we have a few from Hyde Park. Um, one is uh, deeply mourned by his soaring mistress. Another was the most intelligent, faithful, gentle, sweet-tempered and affectionate dog that ever lived. Another brought sunshine into our lives, but took it away with her. Many are so lonely without my doggy. That was a, a, an epitaph that um, was used on multiple gravestones. A devout lover. Uh, he asked for so much, but gave so little. Or he asked for so little, but gave so much, rather. Um, strong emotions there. And these are unlike the epitaph, th these, are, these are very much like the epitaphs we see uh, in the 20th century and even today when we visit um, things like online commemorative sites. Um, another thing that's evident is that grieving a pet for many can be similar to mourning the loss of a family members. You know, some, some owners actually experience feelings of deep loneliness and isolation. This is according to the RSPCA, who need to remind people not to be, not to feel shame or be worried about these, these emotions, that they're perfectly normal. In Victorian society, just as it is today, um, many people feel alone in their, in their grief because not everybody understands what it's like to lose, or not everybody can empathize what it's like to lose uh, an important animal relationship. Luckily today, unlike in the Victorian uh, period, we have multiple charities such as the, the Blue Cross here in the UK, which has support, which have support networks for those who, who have lost their animals. Finally, um, I, plan to continue researching uh, pet cemeteries across the UK. I've identified these broad trends over time, but I'd, oh, I'd like to, to dig into that and see how human animal relationships changed in time and in space. You know, what was it like in urban areas versus rural areas, not just in the UK, but across the world as well in different societies. The problem is there's no database that one can search where to find these things, these pet cemeteries or these individual monuments. Um, so I need your help. If you can quickly, if you know of a, a pet cemetery near you or a, an individual memorial, um, if you could take a photo or just write to me about it, um, I'd very much appreciate it. And finally, thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much, Eric. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, so many questions have, have come in uh, while both you and Jonathan were speaking. Um, so we have a few minutes left, guys. We have 10 minutes left, so I'm not probably going to be able to get through everyone's questions, um, but Eric has given his email address there. Um, I know a lot of people were asking about registers and live pet cemeteries and stuff, so I feel like Eric's probably covered that now. Um, but if not, if you have any further questions or have any spottings of, of, of uh, gravestones, you can you can let him know. Um, great. OK, Eric, as as you were just chatting, you're, you're going to get back again, actually. Um, I'm going to ask you a, a few questions people have have asked. So let me pop you up on the mic. Brilliant. OK, so a big one that people kept asking um, was, uh, which I guess either you or Jonathan could answer, but when was the most recently interred uh, animal buried in, in the Hyde Park Pet Cemetery? Um, I know that we had many of them were just in the late 1800s, but we do have a few mm. in there that are fairly recent. Yeah, I had that on one of my slides, but I forget the actual date. I think it was 1976. 
So there, there are a few here and there, a few random gravestones of animals who somehow were lucky enough to be added to the uh, Hyde Park Cemetery. They're usually on the edges of other gravestones and gravestone rows or, or just in, hidden in the corner. I think they were snuckily inserted there by who knows who working for Royal Parks, maybe. <laughs> Perhaps maybe a, a Royal Parks member of staff dog, for example. I, I can't I can't comment on that. Um, fantastic. Um, a, a big thing that people were asking actually was on the Victorian um, uh, funerals of, of, of pets. One was um, Victorians are well known for portraits of their deceased loved ones. Um, have you found any about uh, uh, of their deceased animals, photos yeah. of their deceased animals? You have. Yeah, there are loads. There are loads. If you if you can probably Google them, um, they'll, they'll come up. So people were doing the same thing with pets. In a few in cases, there are um, photos of deceased people next to pets. And in some cases, you can't really tell if the pets are also deceased or uh, who's alive and who's not. Um, but there, there are many uh, photos out there and I'm not sure there's been that much research on them, but I haven't looked into them. Brilliant. Um, yeah, and also um, following on from that, talking about Victorians um, portraitures of deceased relatives and loved ones. Um, Katie, who's doing the uh, the Good Death talk tomorrow on Victorian rituals, uh, will be covering that as well. So if you can join in tomorrow at half five, please do. Um, another one on Victorian rituals. Um, did Victorians have any funerals for their pets? Yeah, and that was quite highly controversial. So there, there are some photos out there of um, what the funeral would have looked like, and they often included um, little coffins that, that looked like, you know, the same size, same shape as what you would imagine a coffin for an infant would look like, and linens inside, pillows, um, very, very similar to, to human burials. There are um, reports as well, there are, or there are documents telling us about the actual funeral ceremonies. Um, very, very similar to, to human funerals. There would be procession, the ceremony at the grave. The use of funerals is quite controversial as well. So there's a, um, an example from Edinburgh in 1885, I think, there's a report in the newspaper of um, a cat having passed away. The um, a funeral was held, a procession was held, and controversially, the owner decided to bury the cat in a carry in a church. I think it was in a church um, yard. And the crowd was very displeased. The crowd gathered. They were very displeased. And once the funeral ended, they quickly um, deterred uh, the cat and smashed the casket and removed it from the, the coffin. So a terrible story. Uh, but you one that sort of illustrates why it was it was a bit controversial to suggest animals were, were going to heaven or animals had souls or animals should be treated the same as people um, in the 19th century. So that's probably why we see so few of the the um, of ev so few evidence, so little evidence of a pet heaven in the Hyde Park Cemetery. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, that also kind of led on to another question, which I think you've kind of answered, which was, would pet cemeteries be concentrate, consecrated, I beg your pardon, by the church? I'm, I'm assuming not in that case. No. 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 Uh, <laughs> um, fantastic. OK, this one came up quite a lot and lots of people asked in different ways, but at pet cemeteries, we're talking about Britain. Um, are there other cultures that kind of have this kind of mourning for their pets that you know about? Yes, yeah, so um, sticking to sort of Western Europe, um, the pet cemetery movement, the, the earliest one is in Hyde Park, but there are others that all started about the same time. So the earliest one in France, 1899, the earliest one in New York um, State was 1896, all about the same time. There are other places where pet cemeteries um, are quite standard and there's a lot of work on the uh, Buddhist pet cemeteries in Japan where the pets are buried in the same cemeteries as people either in separate pet sections or 
um, together with people. Um, and completely different, uh, they, they do have funerals as well, but obviously a completely different um, ceremony to that funeral. Yeah. So there, there's loads of different examples. Wow, that's brilliant. Um, and then finally, um, I, there was so many other questions, but I guess this kind of catches it all. Um, where can people go for further reading reading about pet cemeteries? I mean, I guess obviously this research paper that you've done is, is a natural uh, suggestion. Yeah, so there's a, luckily the paper that just came out yesterday, um, which summarizes what I found. And um, well, of course, what I found is just based off the survey of four cemeteries. It's it's identifying broad trends visible here in the UK, but what's important is that it, it tells us that you can get information on changing human animal relationships through cemeteries. So that paper is available on Antiquity. I don't know if we have a link to share. That's It's a, it's a freely available paper, um, but there's been lots of reports in the news about it uh, over the past few days, uh, which will include links to that original paper. So if you just Google my name and pet cemeteries, I'm sure you will find something. Brilliant. And maybe perhaps if you can send the link, um, I will be sending out uh, the recording of this video to the people who have signed up so I can uh, possibly attach that too. That would be brilliant. All right, Jonathan, you're up. Eric, thank you so much. That was that was fantastic. Um, Jonathan, I've got a few questions from you. Lots of compliments coming in um, generally about how, how fantastic your presentation was, all these lovely touching and gentle stories. Uh, I did have one person, I'm not sure how um, sincere they were being, but has your dog gotten its driving license? That's the one question people want to know. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, he's just a provisional at the moment. Mm. You know, we're, we're in lockdown, so he doesn't go out uh, that much. Actually, if people are interested, uh, um, my daughter uh, has set up um, uh, Harry's own Instagram page. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, in fact, he, he has something like five times more followers than she uh, actually uh, actually does. Um, can I say, by the way, um, yes. that uh, Eric uh, is sort of hiding his light under a bushel there. His, the research that he's done is absolutely brilliant. Uh, um, and it has deservedly been covered very, very widely in the British press and in fact in the press all the way around the world. So it's definitely worth uh, everyone who's attending uh, this, googling that and looking into it in more detail because it really gives you an insight into uh, the, this whole subject and makes you think more deeply about the way that uh, humans and animals uh, uh, interact. Absolutely. And as I say, I will try and make sure we include the link to Eric's uh, paper when I do send out the recordings to everybody who has signed up. So thanks for that, Jonathan. Um, moving slightly away from pet cemeteries and more into Hyde Park generally, someone's asked what other spooky areas in Hyde Park could people go and visit? Uh, well, I mean, the spookiest area, the, probably the spookiest area in uh, uh, in London is the uh, the site of the Tyburn Gallows, which is uh, at Marble Arch. Uh, um, if you go onto the traffic garden there, you'll see a little memorial plaque uh, to the fact that the gallows were uh, set up there. And um, uh, something like 100,000 people uh, lost their lives between the 12th and the 18th uh, centuries there. Some would have been common criminals, but then there were people who were traitors and other people who died for their uh, religious beliefs. In actual fact, the reason um, why Speaker's Corner um, exists is because before they were executed, um, uh, the condemned men and women were asked if they had any final words. And uh, sometimes they were too drunk to say anything, but uh, <laughs> sometimes they were uh, quite eloquent uh, speaking about their beliefs. And that led to the whole tradition of um, uh, freedom of speech in that uh, corner of the park. So the next time you're in Hyde Park and uh, you uh, happen to go past Speaker's Corner, that is there because literally tens of thousands of people lost their lives uh, at the Tyburn uh, gallows just across the road. Brilliant. Thanks, Jonathan. And if people want to find out more about that, we will be doing our, our walking tours um, in the future. Jonathan, thanks. 
Um, so guys, um, I'm go we're going to finish up now. I just wanted to say a massive thank you to Eric and Jonathan. You have been fantastic presenters. Thank you for uh, volunteering your time to come and speak with us today. I'd like to thank you all for, for joining as well. We had about over 300 people attending this session, which was fantastic. Um, as I said, we are doing a whole host of activities this week. Um, I have sent put the link in the Q&A there if you want to find out more, specifically the fantastic Brompton Cemetery um, tour that we'll be doing tomorrow, looking at Victorian Morning, um, organised by Katie, will be brilliant. Uh, you don't want to miss that. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback. This is the first time we've done a virtual event like this, and we'd love to know how, what we can improve on. Um, I have put the link in the Q&A as well for our survey, so please do fill that in. It should only take about five minutes. Um, and if you want to find out more information about our upcoming events, um, you can go on to our website and sign up to our newsletter. And there we will be telling you when we will be starting back our live uh, walking tours. We're really hoping we can get our live walking tours back so that you can come into our pet cemetery and see these beautiful stones for yourself. But I would like to thank you all so much again for coming. Uh, I wish you all a lovely evening and we'll hopefully see you all very soon. Good night. <laughs>